Welcome back for more Flute Tube. We have mentioned Theobald Burham on Flute Tube more than once, as we definitely should, because he did so much to improve our flutes. The last time that I mentioned him was during our episode talking about the split E mechanism, what it is and why you might want such a thing. I mentioned briefly some of the things that Mr. Burham did to improve our flutes, like how he made the tone holes much larger and he put them where they acoustically make the most sense and where they make our flutes play the best in tune and he covered them with keys. We covered the topic of the split E mechanism in that episode, and I could have addressed another topic at the same time. Instead, I completely ignored that topic on purpose because it's quite a large topic. And that topic is the fascinating history of your G sharp key. Did you know that your G sharp key has a fascinating history? And a lot happened to that key while Berm was in the process of revolutionizing our flute. So if you're excited to hear about the history of your G sharp key, as who would not be, you definitely should be, <laughs> please give this video a like. There are two reasons I really want to talk about this today. One is that if you think about the history of our G sharp key, the various changes it went through and why, there are actually some good practical applications that you can make to how you approach your flute mechanism, your flute playing, your finger technique. The other reason that I want to talk about the history of the G sharp key is that we now in the United States play a berm system flute with a modification that we have a closed G sharp key. But berm's concept was that the G sharp would be an open key. It would stand open. If you're wondering about closed versus open keys, just take a moment and look at the mechanism of your flute. You'll notice that all of the keys are sprung open. The springs in the mechanism cause them to stand open above the tone holes unless you push them down, with the exception of just a few keys. Your D sharp key, which Berm also wanted to have sprung closed, so you have to push a lever to open it. He wanted to do that for stability, so that you'd push that key and it would help you gain stability holding your flute. But he wanted this G sharp key, which on my flute and on most of our flutes is sprung closed, he wanted it sprung open so that you wouldn't push a lever to open it, it would stand open and you would actually push a lever to close that key. The only other closed keys that we have are trill keys. These two trill keys way up here, and if you have it, your C-sharp trill key, that's because they're so high up the tube, if they were sprung open, you would always have to be pushing levers to close them, and that's completely impractical. You can just see, we can't always be pressing these keys. <laughs> so it only makes sense that our trill keys are sprung closed. This change to the berm system flute that we have a closed G sharp instead of an open G sharp key happened very soon after the berm system was introduced. And if you remember clear back to episode three, I talked about how the berm system flute was adopted in Paris much more quickly than anywhere else in the world. There was a flutist in Paris who really aided that to happen. He was a premier flutist in Paris named Dorus, and Berm greatly respected him. He taught at the Paris Conservatory. In fact, he was Taffanel's teacher at the Paris Conservatory, and he did so much to encourage adoption of the Berm system flute throughout Paris. However, before the Berm system came along, all of the flutes that were standard, most of them were eight key flutes, had closed G sharp keys. And when flutists were trying to learn to adjust to this berm system, there were so many changes they had to make, so many different fingerings. In a lot of ways, they were starting from scratch with their technique. And what they struggled with the most was changing from a closed system G sharp key to open G sharp key. So Dorus, whom, as I mentioned, berm greatly respected, quickly encouraged Louis Lott, the flute maker who was making a lot of berm system flutes, to change the way that they made those G sharp keys to stand closed rather than standing open. 
this greatly facilitated adoption of broom system flutes. Because as you can imagine, it's very confusing to train this pinky to do the opposite of what it's always done. So Dorus really helped flutists adopt the broom system flute, but he took this retrograde step of, well, let's not deal with an open G sharp key. That's too much. Let's keep it closed. And I can see why he wanted to do that. If you think about going D to D sharp to E, you push your pinky down to get there. So G to G sharp to A feels quite parallel. But in fact, it's not as logical to do as when you have an open system G sharp. Because if you have an open system G sharp, these two G keys are not connected like this. You press this finger down, you get a G sharp. This second G key that we have would have a lever directly attached to it. You'd press it down and it would close that key and give you G. So you can see that's confusing, that this would be G, then G sharp, then A. And if that's different from what you're used to doing, it may be a reason that you say, forget it, I'm not gonna deal with that new berm system flute. In fact, if you go back and review that episode on the split E mechanism, we talk about how the split E causes your double G key to be physically split, that you can play a high E and this G key will go down, but your top G key will not go down. Well, that is a problem that was not created by Berm, because according to Berm's system, you could press a lever and cause this key to close and this key would stand open. Broom's system, by the way, where you'd press a lever to close your second G key, makes for a much simpler flute mechanism. We've done all kinds of things here with the flute mechanism to accommodate a closed G-sharp system, and it is just more complicated. The reasons that Broom wanted an open G-sharp key were quite legitimate good reasons. <laughs> if we think again about Broom's reasons, one of them was that he wanted as many tone holes standing open as possible. If the G sharp stands open, you have more open tone holes. The more big open tone holes you have, the more your flute will resonate, and of course that's good. So if you're playing C, B, A, and that G sharp is standing open, that gives you a little bit more resonance. The other reason we've mentioned is it makes the mechanics of the flute much simpler. If you look at how we've coped with having a closed G sharp key, this is what we've done. Instead of having a lever attached directly to your second G key, we have this lever here that opens a key underneath your flute. Now here's the deal. This key right here is a duplicate G sharp tone hole. If you look at where it's positioned, it's right underneath this key. And that's the key that if it were to stand open, it would give you G sharp. So instead of having that key stand open, we press this lever, it opens this key that's directly underneath it. So in the tube, as you go down the tube this way, you come to that open hole in the same place in the tube. It's just beneath your finger instead of on the side of your finger here. And that gives you G sharp. You can see it's much simpler mechanically if this just stood open rather than we have to push this lever down to get this to open. And this brings me to another reason why Berm did not like having a closed G sharp key. It's because it's illogical to add fingers to go up. We add our fourth finger to go up chromatically from G to G sharp, where really with our flute tube, we should take fingers off to go up. It makes more sense to go from G to G sharp to A. Berm preferred the open G sharp system flute. He absolutely felt that having open standing G sharp keys was the superior solution. He himself only made a closed G sharp key when a customer specifically asked him for it. We can see from his workshop ledgers, 1847 to 1849, that during those years, he only made two closed G sharp key flutes. And at the same time, he made 128 open G sharp key flutes. I'm going to wrap up this episode by reading you a letter that Berm wrote 
about this issue, he clearly spelled out his preferences and why he preferred the open G sharp key. I'll read an English translation since I'm dealing with English in my videos. And I'm also going to include some links in my video description to some great online resources that talk more about open and closed G sharp keys. So that if you really want to geek out, see a lot of photos, learn a lot more about this topic, you can. But between this week and next week, I really want you to ask yourself, what are the practical ways that we can benefit from this knowledge? Even if we don't choose to switch and adopt an open system G sharp key, what can we learn from the fact that this change happened and that it was hotly debated and that people feel very strongly on both sides of the issue? Is there any way that you can use these concepts to improve your flute playing? Really think about it because I believe there are some and I'm going to talk about those next week. See if you can guess and find some solutions before I tell you my own feelings about how we can use this to improve our flute playing. Munich, 5th of February, 1865. Dear sir, you were right to recommend a flute from me and not from Lot in Paris because my completely logical key system was only made worse in acoustical and mechanical respect by the first flautist, Dorus, in Paris, who made a so-called improvement by a closed G-sharp key. After long consideration, I have made a simple open G-sharp key because all keys of my flute from E1 upwards correspond to the natural movement of the fingers as they are closed and opened by the fingers. Dorus thought to make the new flute more accessible to players on the old flute by making a closed G-sharp key as they were accustomed, but he didn't consider that he thus got more disadvantages than advantages. Lot had made this for him, combining the G-sharp key with the A key. So you get G by pressing down the ring finger of the left hand, as on the old flute, and to get G-sharp, you have to press up the G-sharp key with the little finger as on the old flute. However, the consequence was that both tones, G and G sharp, are produced as on the old flute, whereas in my system, the G is made by closing the G sharp key with the little finger, and the G sharp is made by lifting this finger. I made it so after long consideration, and everybody who thinks the matter over has to agree with me. Dorus himself had to confess that he had made a foolish mistake when I explained the matter to him, and I also made a foolish mistake for Dorus' sake, because I didn't immediately at this time explain publicly the inappropriateness of the closed G-sharp. As Dorus was already the first flautist in Paris, of course all his pupils adopted the flute as he played it. But many accustomed themselves later to the open G-sharp, and even de Vroy told me, not then from me, I'll most probably explain the matter publicly in the near future. Up to now, I haven't considered it worthwhile, because in Germany, England, Russia, and almost everywhere with the exception of France, all flute players only play according to my system. On the paper enclosed, you will find an explanation of the advantages and disadvantages, and you will doubtlessly accept the correctness of my explanations. Yours sincerely, Theobald Brum.